what we've essentially done is that we've discussed, you know, uh, we've discussed cognitive axis, we've discussed cognitive orbit, we've really fleshed out these aspects of cognitive mechanics within the context of here, uh, of, of season 18. And yeah, that's cool, that's, that's important and whatnot, but the reality of the situation is, is that it, as much as, wow, I should probably like actually make sure I spell things correctly and not, you know, lose entire characters, but it is what it is. Um, anyway, the point is, is that like, okay, yeah, thank you. It's all fine and dandy, Chase. You, you taught me cognitive axis. You taught me cognitive orbit. You taught me all these great things about cognitive mechanics. And yeah, you still have to talk about uh, reflection functions or reflect or reflecting functions or reflector functions. Probably going to be reflector functions, honestly. You still have to go into the concept of reflector functions. And uh, that's because I have to read a little bit just to confirm that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but, uh, which that's next month, reflector functions, the first episode of reflector functions is next month. And that is season 18, episode 14, um, uh, the first, um, reflection. Yes. So that's going to be awesome. The first reflection and then 15 will be seconds and then 16, uh, will be the third and then 17 will be the fourth and then we're going to possibly have a guest for episode 18 to talk about the battlegrounds and we will be joined by mr chris taylor i believe for that episode so that'll be awesome I'm really looking forward to that. And he will be introducing a concept of cognitive battlegrounds after we go through the, um, the reflector functions. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's basically what's coming around uh, the corner here. But before we actually like go really deep as to what that means, it's really important to understand like, you know, okay, great. We have axes and orbit. That's great. And now we should probably figure out how to type, you know, using the type grid uh, and how we could use the type grid, you know, to this end. And we already know they're well represented within uh, the, um, um, you know, within the test at discover.csjoseph.life or csjoseph.life forward slash discover, it doesn't matter, it's still gonna take the same place, it's, it's our test, but you know, when you're using, you know, fire and wind, earth and water, etc., those are, you know, basically the, the cognitive functions and, and their various weapons, etc., and how they're on an axis, and then how they end up basically on an orbit, right? So let's let's actually take a moment here and, and flesh that out a little bit uh, for the sake of this presentation. Okay, uh, all right, cool. And let's uh, do that here. Yes, more fancy labels. The reason why I'm choosing to call them reflector functions is because I'm trying to respect the guy who first came up with the concept, which is Dr. John Beebe. So I, I, I don't, want to be like stealing his work and when it comes to talking about reflector functions I will be providing specific source material to that. Don't forget for those of you that have been asking Chase what is your main source material for the four sides of the mind the answer to that is the book Ion by Carl Jung A-I-O-N specifically the first five chapters of that book uh, which delves deeply into the four sides of the mind theory and where it comes from and how it works. The problem is, is that Carl Jung uses nomenclature that I don't exactly agree with. So that's kind of like that issue there. I am going to drink this tea now. I've been waiting to drink it all day. I'm going to drink it now. It tastes good. It's got Dr. Berg's electrolytes in it. I like that. It has bugs if you click on it and lose control of the play buttons. You'll have to record that for me, Stephanie, and explain that. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is, is that I already used the term that um, Dr. John Beebe used for reflector functions, but for something else. Uh, and I like to keep 
our nomenclature really standardized and I don't want to be talking about something else that has the same name and just confusing everybody so I had to like use a thesaurus and come up with a different naming convention so yeah but anyway yeah like next episode we're going to develop it, de delving into reflector functions and uh, reflector theory according to Dr. John Beebe it's going to be really nice and then after that we're going to have Chris Taylor introduce us to the battlegrounds which is also going to be awesome and uh, hopefully he can actually say yes to being on the show and then uh, we're going to move on from there. And then I think the other things that we have left is we got to talk about um, downshift theory, that which is a very interesting um, theory. We also got to talk about um, activations, chaotic versus orderly activations. Going to be going to there as well. Uh, we're going to talk about cognitive teaming and then... And if I remember correctly, we already talked about cognitive focus. If not, then we're going to be talking about cognitive focus from the perspective of the Enneagram. And then we're going to be talking about cognitive focus from the perspective of turbulent versus assertive. I know you folks have been waiting for that for a while. And then, and then maybe look at cognitive projection just a little bit. But I've been talking a lot about projection inside of the cutting edge episodes for members. So I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to be adding that to season 18 or not. And then we'll finish at the end with uh, cognitive rarity, which is the final aspect of cognitive mechanics, cognitive rarity, which is going to be really interesting. And I'm actually hoping to. Uh, you know, bring um, a f uh, some members of the community, uh, some members of the CSJ men's group, actually, as part of that presentation for cognitive rarity, because they've been working a lot with our data. And uh, basically, we're going to be able to start breaking down some of the statistics that we've been able to gather as a result of deploying our tests, etc. And just show you how people are really different and you know in terms of from the perspective of the CSJ community you know how rare certain functions are certain temperaments are how common this or that is it's basically going to be a very nice statistical presentation with some dashboards and we're going to be having that prepared for you as well ready to go you can watch year one right now for season 18 at csjoseph.life forward slash members just get a journeyman membership and you can watch year one there and today we're beginning year two and hopefully you're on the email list and you guys could uh, check this out for year two but this is it season 18 year two episode 13. and we get to play with the type grid which like why wouldn't you want to and we're going to be featuring type grid 3.0 yes for this okay let's let's do this here all right let's see if i can actually uh import it um let's see here copy and uh paste there we go isn't that great you just put the type grid like right here on this whiteboard and we just don't have to care that much awesome we're going to resize it for you folks. Oof, that's not the sizing I was going for. Um, maybe it is the sizing I'm going for. I'm going to put it right here. Awesome. If you would like a copy of the Type Grid 3.0, uh, you can get it now at ultimatemessagingformula.com, which teaches you our sales and communication methodologies using the Type Grid 3.0 in this format right here. Or you can wait another three months maybe six months uh, and a free one uh, the type grid uh, is going to be upgraded to the 4.0 version which means the 3.0 version will then be you know made available for free to everyone else although if you already own ultimate messaging formula I think the 4.0 version will be put into it so you don't have to like pay for like the new one when it comes out if I remember correctly like that that's that's a thing that's a thing so just making sure you guys wear 
aware of all these things. Sorry, it's like, yeah, I just, like, had a baby and whatnot, so, like, I haven't had a chance to, like, talk to anyone or do anything. So I got a lot on my chest, you know what I'm saying? So as I go through this, so. Okay. All right. Yes, nonstop hype. Yes, downshift theory. It's pretty cool. All right, so let's 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 break everything down between axis and orbit. So what what colors do we have up there? All right, so we're gonna use green for this. Um, we got me some green. We're gonna do some uh, uh, we're gonna do some green axis here. So we have SE and then to NI. Okay, and then we're going to have NE uh, to SI with my really terrible arrows and whatnot. Uh, you know, we're not actually doing this in the right order. We're gonna, we're actually gonna switch this out. We're gonna use black uh, to, d okay. Or I just knock stuff off my desk. That's appropriate. All right, so NE to SI, great. And then we're going to have uh, the next one, which is NI to SE. And then the next one is going to be TE to uh, FI, and then FE to uh, TI. And I just realized I did that backwards like a derp. Here I am derping, derping every day. All right, so SE to NI. All right, awesome. So we have our axes right here. And let's do some orbit. Got some orbit. Orbit. Awesome. Orbit gum. Okay, so with the orbit, we have NE to NI. And then we have SE to SI. And then we have, uh, okay, so NE, okay. And then we have TE to TI, and then we have FE to FI. Eventually, you're going to get into reflectors, reflector functions, which is a whole new world, a completely whole new world. It's pretty cool. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty fantastic, actually. But we'll we'll discuss that um, we'll discuss that in a different way. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. How um, I might actually list out the reflectors right here for you guys, just to kind of like wet your tongue on that. But even though we're mostly going to be like talk about axis and orbit, so just trying to uh, figure that. Okay, yeah, I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to list out the reflectors because why not? All right, so. NE to SE, reflector one, right? And then we're going to have, uh, oops, um, okay, so, yes. And then we're going to have uh, NI to SI. Oh yeah, oh, oh. And then we're going to have uh, TE to FE. Oh yeah, fun, fun. And then we're going to have TI to FI. Okay, so you, I'll let you guys like ponder what all that means at a later date. Um, so yeah, those are the reflector functions. So we'll be talking about those relationships at a later date. And this is like literally next episode next month. All right, so yeah, stay tuned to learn about those. So yeah. Um, and yes, it is a form of true opposites. Thank you very much. Okay, but uh, no need to discuss that. We're discussing cognitive axes and cognitive orbit only because they have this huge relationship. Okay, so let's let's define the relationship real quick. Okay, so all right. Um, so remember, uh, orbit, orbit, folks, is external to the four sides of the mind okay so this is external right however um, axes um, which let's just pretend that I did this in blue ink right axes are 
internal, okay? Internal. So internal to like your ego, or it's internal to your sub, or it's internal to your unconscious, or your superego, right? It's internal. But orbit, however, it's external. And it's basically the relationships that the cognitive functions have, depending on the different sides of the mind, going up and down, etc. Right? Different approach. So yeah. So, uh, so just so you guys know, to clarify, reflector functions, they're also known as mirror functions, according to Dr. John Beebe, God bless him. But we changed the name because I already talk about cognitive mirroring in terms of what Templar types do, especially INFJs. So it's not confuse people, especially the INFJs or people who think they might be INFJs or people who are compatible with INFJs or people who are asynchronous with uh, INFJs. We changed the name to reflector. So, but if you guys really want to like look at like the actual you know, source info, pick up energies and patterns of psychological type by Dr. John Beebe. The man is a total badass, INTP badass, even though he technically claims he's an INTJ, but he's not. But I guess according to Socionics, he would be an INTJ. So that's fair if he's using the Socionics lettering system. If we're going to be using the MBTI lettering system, he is an INTP. He is TI hero which I guess it would make sense that you would think he's an INTJ because TI hero is a judging function. But that's neither here nor there. Regardless, the man is awesome. I have great respect for him. Uh, him and Dario Nardi are probably the people I respect the most within the space. And I'm happy uh, to n have known him and had an opportunity to talk to him and I kind of want to do it some more. So anyway, so... Uh, you have to understand, you know, how the four sides of the mind have this relationship with, uh, with, with the, with the axes. So, like I said, you know, the axes, this is internal, and then the orbit is, this is uh, the external, um, external to the individual four sides of the mind themselves. And if you're not really aware of this, this could actually, you know, cause a lot of uh, confusion. Uh, throughout, you know, as you're just trying to understand these things, because remember, you have to see orbit as like a, a backdoor uh, priority system from which your brain through backdoor, uh, uh, you know, neural pathways is able to access and process information via cognition, etc. And you're able to do that from orbit. But in terms of like internal processing, uh, you know, um, so like let, let's let's use an example for this okay so um we are going to put here this awesome uh computer chip thing okay and inside of it you know we're going to put four cores yes four cores right so interesting how our brains have similar architecture right so these, this is this is a CPU, um, literally. This this is a CPU. Okay. So this, you know what? I'm not going to use that color because that just adds further confusion. I'm going to use the awesome rainbow color, as if it's like you know a My Little Pony related. Um, and no, I'm not a brony. Uh, related, uh, you know, software thing. I have no idea. Anyway, so this ends up being a computer chip. Okay. And if they're processing together, right? And if these things are processing together, you have orbit, okay? They're processing together. And this is orbit, okay? That's what cognitive orbit actually does. Technically, you could make the argument that uh, reflector functions do the same uh, in terms of external as well. You could actually argue that there is a more external point, but reality is, um, is connected in a different way and, you know in terms of your brain if we're just using a cpu as the model here now if we're going to go back to uh axes that's completely different because axes actually represent everything on the inside of the specific core okay that's how your brain is processing information and it does it inside the specific core if we're using a cpu as a physical model of demonstration, okay? 
So this is like literally how the structure of our brains work right now, right? Just using this this model right here. So um, so yeah, that would be axis, okay? And this is how your brain interacts with the world internally or externally, etc. It's kind of like how you know you observe how introverted sensors and introverted intuitives decide to walk. Let's say they're going to walk somewhere. Where are they going to walk to? I don't know. But let's just say that there is a destination in mind. How does a uh, yeah Rainbow Dash is like an STP, by the way. Um, just uh, so I know, uh, or just so you know, and Twilight Sparkle is an INFP drama queen that I don't like at all. Anyway, so uh, to our rural America and type people's farm animals, that's crazy, and I don't know if anyone would like that, but maybe I, I should do that. That's kind of interesting. All right, so, so yeah. Orbit under, uh, handles the external stuff. Axis handles the internal stuff. Reflectors, they do also some of the external stuff as well, but from a different point of view. I guess you could actually make the argument you know, for reflectors. If you know anything about CPUs or computer chips, reflectors basically handle the hyper-threading, okay? They handle the hyper-threading of the CPU. And what is hyper-threading? It basically is the other side of the CPU. So you have you have the CPU, right? And it's got your four cores. But what's happening on the back side of the CPU? Oh, another four cores, right? That is the reflector. That is hyper-threading, basically. That's what reflector functions are for, right? And reflector functions are the gateway to the other side of this. Okay, so now we're like, whoa, Mr. Chase. You like just like totally went multi-dimensional here with cognitive functions so are you mean to tell me there could actually be 32 functions you know like okay yes there's a lot of different uh perspectives um uh, basically um there are 16 to the second power uh technically total cognitive functions in your brain technically speaking so 16 to the second power is where an individual cognitive function becomes the anchor point from which your personality uh, acts for a particular process or task or certain instance or situation and whatnot before it moves on to another function to be its anchor point, which, which it pro uh, you know uh, pro uh, processes a task. So yes, technically, it is 16 to the second power, 16 times 16, a 16 by 16 uh, setup. So, um, you know, so, so yeah, 16 times 16, which would be like, you know, 256 different potential combinations for cognitive functions. And this is how reflector functions basically come into play because they're like this other gateway into a whole new level of cognition for yourself in your personality. So, uh, yeah, okay, thanks, Candace. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, the purpose of learning analogies. Yes, I guess I guess this is technically an analogy because our brains are literally anag analogous to uh, computers, to CPUs. We're literally, you know, processing our personality is literally how we process and internalize inf data, information, knowledge, wisdom, and ultimately truth in our daily lives, right? And different personas prioritize those things over others. You know, some personalities prioritize data, some personalities prioritize information, some personality uh, prioritize knowledge, some personalities prioritize truth, even though like there is a logical way to set up that knowledge pyramid per se. The thing is, is that within each individual person's own personality that follows a separate priority system. You know, so data won't always necessarily be in the bottom of that pyramid with truth always being at the top. It may be flipped upside down or it may have different combinations. Either way, it's different. So you got to see the four sides of the mind more of like actually a cube, not necessarily just this two-dimensional representation. 
you know, which a lot of people don't really understand, okay? And this is where reflector functions come into play. And you've heard me talk about God functions in the past, and I know Elliot is like, ooh, anytime I'd say that. But um, I know I've talked about God functions in the past, but I can't really talk more about them later until I, you know, it's probably going to be something I'll probably touch on in the final episode of uh, season 18. And I might actually have an episode devoted to God functions and what they actually look like and what they are for, etc. Um, I'll give you a hint, though, and I'll just say uh, a name, and that name is Captain Planet. And that's all I will say in relating to uh, God functions. And uh, But I still have to like lay out so much more in terms of uh, Season 18 to actually really truly discuss god functions and what they're all about and what they're going to look like again god functions is still a theory uh but it's a really it's i think it's a pretty solid theory especially if you combine it with the material that i've already lectured about in season 17 and i think after you understand the relationship between axis orbit and reflector functions which i'm introducing now and we'll be talking about more in the future uh and how they're basically like a form of hyper threading basically for like a cpu for brains um yes very very true uh, lorenzo uh yes um then then you'll start to see like where god functions actually come into play from a mechanical standpoint fair warning though that episode will be very very voodoo and woo woo and like way out there in as much as my first like three or four episodes of season 17 playlist here on this youtube channel were absolutely out of control and like i let my any hero just take off and i was literally in orbit of the planet earth and then it went all the way out as far as the sun and then outside of our solar system it was a fantastic uh situation so yes, I did not forget about God functions and demigod functions and what all of that means and what it looks like. That is stuff that will be coming much later, likely the final episode of season 18. And if for some reason I forget to talk about it, I'm sure Elliot is going to basically ride my ass until I actually talk about it finally. But I have to lay the groundwork down, and this is kind of some of the reasons, you know, as to this is. So Anyway, this episode, like, you know, it's kind of a wrap up of what we've been talking about with axis and orbit while also introducing reflector. But I also want to get into some nice little um, how to. It's really important. And it's kind of we're going to be doing a little bit of review of the how to just so that you folks can actually see, um, you know, some examples, you know, using uh, using a type grid. So, OK. Um, Let's uh, let's see. Who should we pick on for this? I think we need to pick on somebody for our um, demonstration. Maybe I need to like go to Facebook.com and start reading up on somebody's um, Facebook profile that I'm friends with, huh? That might uh, that might be cool. Maybe maybe we should do that, right? You know. So. Let's see here. Let's see here how we could do that. Oh, actually, I forgot. There is one thing I actually forgot to do. Let me um, let me fix what I forgot to do. All right. So don't forget, you know, looking at axis and orbit. So this axis is water uh, plus Earth. Okay. So water and Earth. This is wind plus fire. Okay. This is bow, oops, box, no, bow plus spear, oops. Uh, this is mace plus sword for this one. Up here, it's getting a little bit interesting. This right here is water and fire. Yeah, this one is earth plus wind, right? And then this one is bow plus sword. Okay. And then this one is um, mace plus spear. Okay. And then up here we have uh, 
water plus wind, right? And then you have uh, fire plus earth. And then you have bow plus mace. And then you have sword and spear. Okay, all these things are necessary to know when you're navigating the type grid because it helps you identify where certain things are, etc. Uh, water beats fire any day. That's not necessarily true. While water can put out fire, fire can boil water, fire can evaporate water. So there are certain situations where fire can absolutely, you know, subdue water, but it cannot absolutely defeat it or extinguish it. Etc. So yeah, but fa but fire, as long as it's burning brightly, and it is the yang, whereas water is the yin. Water is the default. That's why the yin is effectively indestructible because it's the default state of the universe. Fire is extremely powerful and can actually hold water at bay if it is strong enough. But it will be at bay, and it will be you know inevitable, right? You have to understand these little metaphysical concepts. Um, so yeah, as Cynthia says, not if you have enough fire. Yes, very true. Wow, this whiteboard is extremely busy, but it is what it is. Okay, so using using this, um, oh, I can actually write on that. That's cool. Uh, all right. So yeah, so um, here is a. Uh, Let's use black for earth. So here's an earth user, here's an earth user, here's an earth user, here's an earth user, right? Okay. And then here's an earth user, and then here's an earth user, earth user, earth user. Okay. So found our earth users. Awesome. Let's look at our water users. Oh, we got a water here, water here, water here, water here, water here. And water is there, water is there here on this type grid, and water is there. So you found all of your earth and water people just right there. That is literally eight of the types right there. Earth and water people. But what about fire and wind? Okay, so let's look at some fire. We've got a fire user, fire user, fire user, fire user, fire user. There's another one, there's another one, and there's another one. Oh wait, it's the people that we didn't circle, right? And because of my fire, we also have my wind. So here's a wind, here's a wind, here's a wind, here's a wind, my wind, my wind, my wind, my wind. All right. So you can kind of already see like we have individual functions, you know, laid out here on this hype grid, etc. You know, based on what it is. And remember. Because if you have an axis, so using using axis on the type grid here, if you have an axis, you will always have the same thing, S I N E. You know, axis, axis, axis. If you have one, you have the other. 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 It's really not that hard, until of course you can't actually see what Chase is writing because the type grid is basically turned into an absolute total shit show. Yes, because I'm out of my mind and I'm just giving everybody, you know, a color collapse here. So those are the axes, at least those are the perceiving axes. And we haven't even done the, uh, we haven't even done the decision making or the judging axes. Don't you guys see just how much data is actually in the type grid? Don't you guys see just how complex the type grid actually is it's insane it's insanely complex there's so much data here you like you know it, it's it's amazing the total cognition of mankind is literally contained within the type grid here and it's all over the place you know so it's uh it's a thing it's important all right so yes we got our um Little things here. Gonna erase a little bit. Make it easy on ourselves. Okay. 
and orbit orbits also very interesting too the thing is is that you have to remember something about these this is an ego 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 these are ego so being able to like have um you know their shadow visually portrayed here on uh on the type grid is something we're going to be looking at um so we're going to be attempting to um portray uh that to that end so the problem is the type grid is going to get pretty busy if you think about it uh All right. Okay. Yeah, it's it it's insane, you know, but again these are egos. So, and because you know what their ego is, you automatically know what their shadow is. Okay, so let's let's pick one. Let's pick INFJ. We know N I F E T I S E is there, and its shadow is technically right here. This is its shadow, okay? So then you have the uh, you have the shadow, and then you have the ego represented right here between these two types, okay. And then you have cognitive orbit, right? And cognitive orbit is this here. You know, so you can kind of see like how it's visually portrayed here in the type grid, you know, to that end. Um, so yes, the type grid is effectively a Rubik's cube. That is correct. It is a um, it is an array. It is um, it's uh, it's an abacus, basically. That's what it is. It's an abacus. It is calculus. Our brains are put up in this uh, calculus-based st structure. Um, this abacus, basically, it's literally the are all cognition and each human being is just little pieces of this so here's how orbit interacts and orbit you know orbit is a form of compatibility right orbit is compatibility yes orbit is a compatibility right <laughs> well Orbit is where you have, you know, pretty good relationships because it's got this one-to-one -one compatibility relationship. That's awesome. But what were to happen if we were to take a different type where that was like, you know, not the case? Let's look at, um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Um, let's look at camaraderie. Um, let's do ranger. Okay, so these two types here have the same exact ego okay they have the same ego and this ends up creating a um, a, a camaraderie relationship uh, camaraderie okay this creates a camaraderie relationship so there's going to be like negative you know to this one whereas this one this relationship is a positive okay positive but you need negative for growth, okay? So negative ends up becoming growth. We end up getting growth. We end up getting learning, right? Uh, growth and learning. Whereas this one becomes, we get love and friendship, okay? This is like the relationship between the individual types. But the same thing goes within like, you know, the thing that you're missing from your ego, which effectively is your shadow, you're looking in other people to become more a more complete person, right? And that's why you get compatibility from what typelogic.com calls your contrast type. Most people, and contrast types, don't get me wrong, can have a lot of conflict, sure. But not as bad as conflict in terms of camaraderie because camaraderie actually provides challenge and if you think about it camaraderie is actually closer to the yang whereas compatibility is much closer to the yin in terms of those yin and yang energies you know from the taoist point of view the yin being entropy or um, decay or chaos 
in the long run, right? That's where it is, where you know, chaos, etc. Which I guess it kind of makes sense that high compatible relationships are actually more prone to chaos uh, because it's the other person, you know, fulfilling the other person, you know, and, and they're fulfilling each other basically. Whereas camaraderie, it's not really so much about fulfillment, it's about advancement, it's about growth, and growth can be a very painful process. Just like maintaining the young is a painful process, just like being a man, being a masculine man is a painful process. No one cares. No one cares if you have a, had a bad day. You know, it's easy for women to cry and complain about their bad day, but it's not so easy for a man, right? It's the difference between yin and yang right there, right? So the yin is actually closer to compatibility uh, to that standpoint. So these these relationships are extremely important to be aware of when we're looking at, you know, how, how uh, you know, people interact with each other within their lives, etc. But how do you go about like understanding how to type people you know in this way well when it comes to axes and orbits including reflectors uh when it comes to these different things people's behaviors just start manifesting you know from that you know standpoint so we lightly talked about this in past episodes regarding orbit and whatnot but we're gonna we're gonna look at you know what people say and what people do right so, okay, I'm gonna probably play with some visual typing here too, actually. So I'm gonna go to Facebook right now and let's, let's see about typing certain people on Facebook. Let's see, uh, or maybe, maybe, I don't know if I should do Facebook or not, I'm not sure. Um, uh, okay. Let's see here. Uh, apparently, the page is not there anymore. All right, we're we're gonna we're gonna pick on we're gonna pick on Mr. Chris Taylor because why not? Why not pick on Chris Taylor? I like Chris Taylor. I like picking on Chris Taylor. He likes picking on me, so. It's only fair, right? Good old Chris Taylor. Oh, let's see here. Let's let's go to post. I'm gonna go to the specific post. Um, or I'm not gonna go to that specific post. Okay. All right. So we got we got Chris Taylor right here. This is Chris Taylor. Good man. ENFP, fantastic fellow. But let's look, let's let's talk about this. Like, let's look at cognitive axis and cognitive orbit. You know, in terms of what he's doing. Like, you can already tell that Chris Taylor is an SI user. He's wearing a bit of black, being super comfy. You know, uh, pretty uh, pretty decent. You know, beard approach with what he does here, etc. Um, and then we actually have him acting right here in a comment that he says he's like say say Ulfric Stormcloak murdered the High King with his voice shouted him apart okay so he's actually using this is TE child classic TE child using a um, specific um, you know he's, he's referencing he's making a reference he's making a quote I do this all the time with my TE critic because I I'm shadow focused and I was able to develop it over time but he does it way more than me he literally thinks in references he thinks in qualifications constantly it's a very TE approach so if you see if you see something like this like on a social media you can automatically go back to the type grid and it's like okay you know I already know just by default that I'm looking at a TEFI user already. You know, he's got, you know, TEFI, here's another TEFI, you know, so, so TEFI is in those two types, it's in that type there. Uh, it's also, it's also right here. And then it's also right here. And then we have right here and here, cool. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
and then seven. Okay, yeah, okay, great. All right, so already, just off of this, we know that we've completely eliminated all these types just right off the bat, just completely. Using cognitive axis, right? We've eliminated all that. So you already got half the work done. You know what I'm saying? And then we see how he's dressed with that photo, right? So we instantly know that just on that photo, he is an SI user. That's cool. So he's an SI. There's SI right there. There's SI there. There's SI there. There's SI there. Which means we can then eliminate this one here, this one here, this one here. Okay. This one here as well. All right. So now you got it down to four types. So that's just using two separate cognitive axes in a visual typing approach, or at least looking at social media. You already can make that judgment. So you already have basically used this methodology to find Mr. Chris Taylor's um, quadra. That's what we did. Because guess what? The only people that are left over are philosopher types. You know, because we literally saw an example of TE and an example of SI. And SI, automatically, we know that he's an NE user, so he's SI plus NE through axis. And we automatically know because of TE, he has FI, which means he's automatically a philosopher. That's it. You automatically know that. But of course, you'd have to you know, delve deeper into his social media to find out more. You know, you'd have to look at, maybe strike up a conversation with him on Facebook Messenger. Is he initiating new points? Is he changing the, subje uh, the subject? If that's the case, then he would be one of the initiating philosophers, which would be Judicator or Bard, ESTJ or ENFP. Or is he what letting, is he, or is he causing you to set the subject? Then you'd know that he'd be more of a mystic, INFP or an archivist, ISTJ, etc. right? That's how stupidly easy this is to using the type grid and using cognitive axis, right? Super, super easy. Have you guys, uh, have you guys like realized how simple this stuff is and why we use cognitive axis? Now, cognitive axis just alone lets you completely unlock the type grid and you could so quickly using the process of elimination just to figure out, you know, what type is who. Have you guys considered that? Um, yeah, just by what he quoted and the way he dressed. And you instantly know he's a philosopher quadra. Just on that, those two pieces of information. Literally on that one photo, which we were able to identify any SI, and then his comment, we were able to identify TEFI instantly. Just done. So... Yes, it is recommended that you find a pattern of behavior. Uh, I have the benefit of knowing Mr. Chris Taylor ahead of time, so it's easy to use him as an example. But this is no different than what I do during the How to Type Famous People, because I literally follow the same exact process. It's just with what they're saying and how they look and how they carry themselves, and literally everything, you know, in the context of the live streams where I'm doing How to Type Famous People or How to Type Random People. It's the exact same thing. It's no different. But like, as soon as you get like one piece of information, even two pieces of information, you've just completely eliminated all those types instantly. And you don't even have to worry about it anymore. Because now, what we're able to see now is that we have all of the philosophers chosen. Just right there all the philosophers. So, no, it's not hard at all, Amartaj. Do you know why? It's not hard at all. I'll tell you why. Because if they have a history of a lot of posts over time, the ego always bleeds through. And all you have to do, if we were to go back to Mr. Chris Taylor's profile, which I'm not going to do because I'm going to preserve his privacy, um, 
we could actually see all of his past posts and things that he shared on his wall on Facebook, for example. We could probably do the same thing on Twitter and get an idea of exactly, you know, who he is and how he behaves, right? It'd be pretty simple. Very, very simple to do that. So, yeah, but the difference between you, Tanya, and someone else is that you're probably going to care about your lashes, or you're going to care about whether or not you have acne on your face, or you're probably going to wear foundation, or you're probably going to make sure your hair actually looks nice, whereas the SI user is not really going to do that. They're not. That's the difference. It's all about where you're spending your effort. Um, isn't someone's dress shaped like nurture? It can be, but it doesn't matter, FT, because at the end of the day, like how a person is dressed, you know, determines a lot. So let's let's we can use some additional examples of people. Um, let's uh, let's go to Google Image Search, maybe. Um, let's see here, Google Image Search. Let's throw out like a random actor. Give me, give me a random actor, or some somebody like that. I w we could easily find, like some some kind of random person, etc. Yeah, well, your reaction that it's gross, Tanya. I mean, that's why you're an SI user because an SI user wouldn't find that gross. So. Uh, your Facebook profile picture took ages to make perfect. Okay, thank you, Mr. NTJ. Um, that's correct, Lorenzo. I'm saying that they may actually be SE users. Yes. Charlize Theron. Okay. Camila Mendez. Okay. Uh, Mendez. Okay. I hope this is who you're talking about. Okay, let's see. Is there a photo of her randomly walking around with somebody? Let's see. This might be more accurate. Um, okay, so let's see here. All right. All right, so we got Camila Mendez here. And... I'm going to say, with how she carries herself in this photo, I mean, let's be honest, like, no SE user is going to be caught dead wearing this. That's why I actually think she's an SI user, and I think this man is an SE user. He kind of looks like an ISTP. She's kind of dressed a lot, very ISTJ is, very SI hero. She definitely seems like an SJ. And SJs, because they have a shadow, uh, an SP shadow, they actually can, like, you know, with makeup and other things, they can kind of transform themselves and make themselves look like, especially when they're in the spotlight, make themselves look like this uh, SE user, when the reality of the situation is they're not. Look at, look at, uh, look at this photo as well. Look at, he's an SE user. He's got the hair going on, really cares about his aesthetic and whatnot. He's got, he's got his chest hair showing, which is very SE uh, oftentimes. Uh, and she's just like, meh, it's cool. You know, or I'm in this comfortable dress and I don't care that this dress looks completely but ugly and boring because let's be honest, this is boring AF, but she is an SI user trying to play up her lower SE basically as as a result right so you know going back to the type grid we know that uh you know based on cognitive access and whatnot she is an introverted sensor so that is all of these types right here we have introverted sensing and then we have uh, more introverted sensing here 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 and here which means we can eliminate this type, 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 and this type. So there you have it. We've eliminated those eight types. That's pretty cool. So let's 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 uh yes, I'm I'm literally going to be like internet stalking people for you folks during this live stream to show how easy this is. Okay. So um, 
All right, cool. So uh, Camila Mendez. Um, oh gosh, this is so introverted sensing right here. Definitely, definitely introverted sensing. Uh, okay. She's always trying to be elegant, and whatnot, playing up like, wow. Does she like actually think that's attractive? That is not. That is boring. This is like the most boring getup I have ever seen. This is completely boring. This this is this is gross to me. This is gross. This is not attractive. I would never, ever approach a woman like this. So yeah, no thanks. This just makes my introverted sensing like like grossed out. Like seriously, don't don't do that. Unless, you know, you're an SI user looking for an SE user and you don't care, then sure, do that. But if you're trying to like get with an ENTP, don't do that. Like no, don't worry this. No. That ain't gonna work. All right, so let's look at some other aspects of Camila Mendez, shall we? Uh, let's check her Twitter. The problem with Twitter is that it may be a bot, so let's make sure like it's actually hers. So. All right, so 2.5 million followers, 149 following. Okay, the home issue. She's in the home issue. Okay, I guess that's so like SJ-ish of her. Um, yes, this movie is very special, and I'm so happy it's being recognized as such. Congrats. Okay, so very special indicative of super of optimistic fi or fe whenever you see something that says oh this is very special right something that's very special is that way right they're really over emphasizing it so that means they have an fi nemesis or an fi trickster or an fe nemesis or an fe trickster okay fair enough we can work with that omg um okay Okay, let's see here. Show more. So she retweeted that, retweeted that. Don't care. These people are adorable. Okay, such a lovely chat. Tune in Monday. Okay, when they say had such a lovely chat, that's also indicative of SI because she's talking about her own experience, right? So going back to the type grid, we instantly know this is still an SI user approach, you know calling people adorable I'm going to have to say they're affiliative okay she this woman is definitely affiliative going back to the type grid we could further eliminate types just off of that okay so so the pragmatic types are out she's not an INTP she's not an ENTP now granted we're talking about access and orbit primarily, but it is important to take on the other aspects of the type grid because we know that these types, for example, up here, um, these are pragmatic, you know, just like these types are also pragmatic. The other ones are affiliative. So we got six types left. We got six types, let's keep going. So had a such a lovely chat. Okay, yeah, you had and a lovely chat. So lovely chat. Okay, so lovely chat combined with adorable. It's kind of around the same category of words. Looking more and more like an FE user, but let's keep going. So Veronica is an Upper East Side badass. I didn't expect anything less. Okay. Uh, Okay, so this, uh, I'd box a bear for you. Serial killer genes isn't the only genes I want to get rid of. Are you a maple snow cone because I want to lick you? Okay, interesting. Um, okay. Uh, Y'all ain't ready for this one. Check back tomorrow, February 5th for UD Nunes feature. Okay, Thursday night's lineup. Uh, how are we feeling? Not going to lie, I cried during the, the graduation sequence. This is more indi indicative of introverted feeling, sympathy, feeling sympathy for other people as a result. 
I would post my audition tape in honor of the non nomination. So she's talking about something that is in honor of something, giving honor to something. Should I post? She's like, should I post my audition tape in the honor of the uh, nomination? Okay, should I? Should I is another uh, indicative of introverted sensing from that standpoint. But then she's talking about honor, right? She's talking about uh, duty, the affiliative approach. Uh, so that's that's pretty interesting as well. Uh, and then she was showing some sympathy earlier. So that is F-I, that's F-I-T-E. So let's, let's keep going. Um, Honoring, though, can be F-E. You can make that distinction, so we need to have more data. Let's collect more information. All right, it's mostly me sobbing, teeth knockout scene, and frantically playing four different characters. Serious question. I love Marie. She's been serving attitude in my profile for as long as I can remember, but is it time to change my profile photo? Uh, so basically performing an extroverted thinking survey. The people have spoken. Marie stays. I don't make the rules. Submitting to some other kind of authority. Okay. All right. So and doing another example of extroverted thinking, uh, like performing a survey, etc. So this is obviously someone who is an FITE user. Great. So we can eliminate even more types now. So we've eliminated the knight and we've eliminated the cavalier because we have identified that she is also F-I-T-E. So we're going to erase this here. We're going to erase this here. Folks, we have another philosopher type on our hands. Okay. So she is one of these. She is a philosopher type. Again, another example of using access to get yourself around the type grid, etc. Okay. So let's keep going. All right. Uh, uh, okay. Attention, uh, Dewey Skin Lovers has entered the chat. Um, I forgot about this. Uh, today's the last day they registered to vote in Georgia. Okay. All right. So let's see. Let's go back to that uh, final results. Let's see. Good days. Such I don't make the rules. It's so much easier if you can actually see like a thread of her speaking to determine because you kind of need that and you have to go elsewhere. Okay, let's see if we win. Uh, Kiara Moreno. No, no, no. Chaosis, which means what are you doing? Aser to do. Okay, is this you? Okay, does she actually reply to any of these? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, let's go to her Instagram. Instagram, Camilla Mendes. Okay. Okay, so let's see, comments. Does she respond to any of the comments? So this is her posting herself on the front of this magazine. Okay, uh, okay, let's see if she has any replies. Uh, nope, nope, nope. Be nice to actually see a discussion and by this time you usually have someone else running your Instagram for you so this is not likely to be a good option. Oh look at that introvert sensing approach. It always happens. Anyway I'm getting a little bit off topic here. The point is that I'm trying to make folks is that you can use access to really navigate your way through the type grid to identify the specific quadra of the person. Yes, you still need to use interaction styles or temperaments, also you know, also known as communication styles, or uh, you know your worldview, etc., which is like you know temperament approach. But each of those things, 
helps you like drill down deeper than just quadra. You know, you can still use axis to do quadra. Now let's talk about orbit. So orbit, using orbit on the type grid is actually very difficult because you have to be aware of different situations where things are going, you know, in an orbit. But we do have an example with this person. So using this photo right here, she's actually going in and out between her orbit. She's very, very colorful with this dress and whatnot, but she's also very comfortable at the same time with how she's doing her hair. So this is indicative of someone who has high SI and this, uh, with lower SE, basically. Okay, so you can kind of also identify specific functions using orbit. And this is just a visual direction or visual recommendation or visual how to using uh, Cami Mendes as to how this works. Um, but uh, you can see how orbit is playing out, right? Oh my gosh, she's got that, uh, she's got that uh, Kristen Stewart look here uh, within, uh, which, which also does the same thing. You can see that uh, you know the SE the SE is actually pretty low and the SI is really really high. So I would already you know using orbit to kind of eliminate it more in terms of like okay you have higher SI this is probably SI of top two slots because your SE is is there it is capable and it seems like your SE may be optimistic but still in your shadow. So like, um, not a photo like this, let's get to something a little bit more natural, et cetera. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, here's, here's, here's a good example. Uh, her uh, at a restaurant, et cetera. Her SI is there, really high, um, still going for comfort, but still has, but at least she still tries. She still puts in an effort for her visuals and for her aesthetics, basically. When this happens, you know that she's an SI user within her ego and cognitive orbit wise though, because it's really high in her ego, that means her SE would also be really, really high, which would mean that she would also technically be an SE nemesis because it's coming off in a very optimistic approach. Therefore, I would already conclude that she's an ISTJ. We know she's a philosopher and then you're looking for an extroverted sensing that is optimistic in the shadow, which means it would have to be trickster or it would have to be a, uh, or it would have to be an SE nemesis. The difference is folks, does an SE, does an SE trickster dress like this? No, they don't. I mean, she's paying attention. She cares about her hair. I mean, look at this. She's going out of her way to do it herself. This is like obviously product placement and whatnot, but, uh, you know, and, and then she's, and she's wearing this tank top, like that's so SI. So, but yeah, and if by combining, the point is combining cognitive orbit with cognitive axis, you're basically able to identify the specific functions that are being used. If you start with axis, you drill down to the specific orbit and then you use, uh, or drill down the specific quadra and then you look at their orbit essentially okay am I looking at you know pessimistic or optimistic functions here okay so we know she's an SI user is her SI really really high is it in the top two slots is it parent or hero or is the SI pretty low is it uh, is it child or uh, inferior and because of that you instantly know where the placement is for the uh, expert sensing because if it's SI hero, it's automatically expert sensing nemesis. If it's SI parent, you automatically have expert sensing critic, you know, but critic is not, uh, it's not um, uh, optimistic. But then it's like, okay, well, hold on, Chase. What about SE trickster? Like what, what, is, what does SE trickster look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. So we can go to csjoseph.life forward slash famous. We can look at some SE trickster women, for example, to compare her to, because it's all about comparing folks. You could just compare and contrast until you actually can figure out what it is you're trying to look for. So INTPs, uh, let's see here. Uh, Meg White from the right stripes. Um, it's really lame that we don't have very many INTP women represented here and they're supposed to be, which I don't know why there isn't. Um, okay, let's see, who is, um, 
let's go back. Okay, so uh, Meg White, uh, White Stripes. Okay. Yeah. So basically having your hair pretty much done the same way every time. Uh, very comfortable, etc. Just like, okay, yeah, meh. Going into the ENTJ shadow often. Here's an example of her just like being, yeah, whatever. I don't really care. I just don't care about my visuals that much. It just kind of is what it is. Oh yeah, I'm going to pretend to care. Here's a great shot. Look at, look at how frizzy that hair is. She just doesn't care. You know, this is an example of someone who has SI and that we could have identified using cognitive axis, you know, but from that standpoint, you know that her SI is lower because her SE is even lower. So you instantly know that this SI user is an intuitive, okay, even if you did access to identify her quadra. So then it's like, okay, she would have to be an intuitive crusader type because she is, um, or, or, in, or it, like she'd have to be like an INP essentially. So you identify quad, you identify your quadra using cognitive access. Okay, she's obviously a crusader type. And then which one has like just you know which of these crusader types really struggle with their visuals? Well then, okay, INTP, right? As as an example. Um, let me let me try another one. Let me try another one. Let's let's do a different person. Let's do let's do Tarja Turanen, uh, or Turanen. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, and she is the opposite. She is a um, she's an ENTJ, if I remember correctly. Yeah, an ENTJ. So let's see here. All about her visuals, this ENTJ woman. But you can see that she constantly is going out of her way to the end. Let's see here. Uh, Tarja uh, to, there we go. Tarja official. She used to sing for Nightwish back in the day before she got fired because she treated her fans like crap because her FI went like super selfish mode one time, which is pretty lame, but it happens. Good singer though. Uh, so yeah. Definitely caring about her her visuals and how she looks, especially within these photos and whatnot. Uh, going out of her way, doing the lashes, doing the lipstick. This is like so. This is Essie Child, right? If you were to compare this, um, you know, to um, the other to Meg White, for example, you see a complete contrast entirely. You know, this is an INTP right here. This is an ENTJ. She's wearing lipstick. She's doing her hair. She's got the lashes, etc. And again, this just allows you to help you navigate the, the type grid appropriately. It seems pretty complex, but you get the point that I'm, I'm going with. JK Rowling is SE Demon. JK Rowling, JK Rowling is, is an INFJ, like seriously. Um, let's, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm going to do, uh, let's go back to Camila Mendez. Okay. Um, JK Rowling. Okay. Images. So I, I really, I, we haven't touched much on visual typing, so I really wanted to like, just look at it a little bit more. So yeah, here's an example. She cares about her aesthetic, really going out of her way in that, you know, cute INFJ way that they can do when they're not dressed like freaking hippies, which is which is nice because usually INFJs think it's okay for them to like not be hippies. Um, let's see here. In this photo, she's effectively a clone of my ex-girlfriend. She looks just like her in almost every way um, and whatnot. Definitely caring about her visuals and her approach very modest, etc. Uh, still very SE, but the SE is a little bit lower because she's kind of getting closer and closer to that ISTJ boring look, but she's still not. She's got the earrings, she's got the lipstick, she's got the lashes, she's got the hair going on, etc. Uh, she's able to make it work, basically. Here's another example using uh, using jewelry in the same way. 
she uh, definitely has an interesting use of jewelry, as most INFJ women absolutely would. Here's an example of her, uh, you know, going over the top, because SE Inferior can definitely go over the top. And, uh, you know, documentary premiere, she's looking really professional because she's super affiliative, and affiliative people like to look the part when it's like, oh, my role is a professional, so I'm going to dress like a professional, right? Uh, etc. Where if they're like having this perspective of, oh, my role is to be a slut, so I'm going to dress like a slut. You see what I'm saying? That kind of uh, approach. So, uh, but yeah, you, you can instantly see how cognitive functions are coming out and changing, uh, you know, when, when considering uh, axis and orbit, etc. Uh, to that end. I don't know why this reset on me here. That's kind of annoying. Okay. So anyway, the point is, folks, do you actually understand what it is I'm explaining here and how all of this works? I, I really would like to know because this is a pretty really, this is really uh, hard to understand and very complicated, extremely complicated. I'm going to exit out of that to give myself some more system resources. So yeah. Uh, no, J.K. Rowling is SE Inferior. She is an INFJ. Yes, very much so. Okay, so, anywho, the point is, is that that's how you use axis and orbit to type. You use axis, and, and if you're going to ignore temperaments, uh, if you're going to ignore communication styles, um, so uh, communication styles, we're calling it your expression, basically. Temperament is more of like a person's worldview. Uh, uh, but axis uh, identifies your magic, which is perception functions. And then we have uh, weapons, which is judgment functions. And then you have your house, and that's your, your quadra. But to fast track to learning a person's house or their quadra, whether or not they're crusader, philosopher, templar, wayfarer, etc., all of these things, these, these four houses, to identify which house a person's personality belongs to, it's best if you start with cognitive access first. And once you identify, and once you go all the way through their cognitive access, and you identify their magic, and then you identify their weapons, basically, within the context of the type grid itself, once you're able to do that, you instantly know what house they are in. You know what quadra. And then to drill down further from there, you can use cognitive orbit to kind of figure out, okay, do they have high SI? Do they have high SE? Do they have high NE? Do they have high NI? You can use aesthetics or visual typing. You could also uh, look at how they type things, uh, the speed at which they type, or how they respond. They respond in giant paragraphs, or they hit enter after every time they have a complete thought in their head, and every thought has a different line, etc. I do that all the time. It really annoys people. It also annoys me when an INFP is writing to me and they write this huge book and I have to spend like five minutes reading it. It's really annoying. And little do they know that the SE child people of the world actually just completely skip it and don't even bother reading it, even though they put all the effort into reading it to begin with, which is kind of interesting to me and pretty sad at the same time, because sometimes as a fellow NP, I definitely feel their pain because I'm often dismissed by NJs who just constantly skip everything every that I always write to them because those NJs believe that those messages have lost energy or whatever. It's like the most annoying thing in the world. But the bottom line is... It's, uh, you know, that's just how it is. So you use cognitive orbit to identify, you know, where their functions are. Are they in the top two functions, the bottom two functions of the ego? And you could do the reverse, figure out where shadow functions are. Are they in the top two functions of the shadow or the bottom two functions of the shadow? And that will really help you drill down and actually truly give you the ability to type people using cognitive functions alone. I've always been verbally against people typing with cognitive functions alone. I've been against it my whole time, and this is why, because people aren't doing it correctly. If you want to type via cognitive functions alone, you have to learn how to use axis and orbit together to be able to actually do that. And then eventually you can add in reflector functions to it as well, and then you'll have a complete and total understanding of how to type people using cognitive functions alone. But this whole notion of, oh, that's so NI of them, or oh, that's so TE of them, yeah, that's bullshit. Yeah, it's, 
it's complete bullshit, so don't do that. That's not actually how it works, okay? So uh, it's 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 not it's it's not a thing. So so based on that, guys, like understand that this is the proper and true way of how to type using cognitive functions by themselves. That's the entire point of this lecture is to demonstrate that to you. And I want to throw in some visual typing and some social media typing in there to kind of get you guys more familiar with some of those techniques. But this is the strategy that you use when you're engaging with a type grid to be able to enable yourself to type people specifically via cognitive functions instead of, uh, you know, just being like that random, you know, armchair psychologist who thinks they know what the MBTI is, even though the MBTI is a complete waste of time. And then have them be like, oh, I'm going to try to identify specific functions and other people. And I'm like, wow, are you like a poster child for the objective personality system right now? Because that's what they do. And they're inaccurate often. Their system's cool, but the methodology that they follow in terms of how to type somebody is completely subjective and completely inaccurate. You can't do that. You have to be using all these little systems, these subsystems to the type grid to be able to interpret the type grid appropriately so that you know that you are 100% you accurate. Because any judgment or qualification that you make on the type grid, you should be able to use a different vector, a different way of using the type grid in a different direction to be able to come up with the same answer. And so that you can always check your work to guarantee that you are always 100% correct when you're using the type grid. That's how it works. But a lot of people don't even know that. Okay. So anyway, that's it for uh, season 18, episode 13. I, it's nice that Elliot shared his opinion with us, saying that this is pretty basic stuff. I, I not everybody is as smart as you are, good sir, uh, because I'm sure plenty of people uh, struggle with this. Um, especially uh, FPs and FJs, they have huge struggles with this. It's easier for an FJ to use the type grid, but FPs really, really struggle because the only available thinking that they have in their brains is via qualification. I'm just saying like, it'll be really hard for FPs to, to figure out these concepts. It's really, really hard. And you know, and this what this does is it allows them to kind of have some kind of process of qualification instead of what TI users use, which is a process of deduction or a process of elimination, right? But you know, if you're TI hero or if you're TE hero, you could just cognitive transition to kind of use both qualification or elimination. And kudos to you for being able to do that. But the rest of us out there, we can't do that. We just can't. And FPs have it the hardest. FJs have it the second hardest tps uh, you know and tjs they have it pretty equal in that area uh, they, they in terms of being able to do it and this is why in my opinion i think estps probably have the easiest time typing people out of all of the 16 types with the infj as a close second because they have estp subconscious that's not to say that they still struggle with te trickster because the infj has been studying mbti their whole life and then they discover cs joseph they effectively have to completely unlearn everything within their si demon in order to be able to come up with the proper conclusions or else they're going to be completely screwed and that's really hard for si demon to do because the only way to change si demon is to constantly overwrite it you have to overwrite it it's kind of like defragging a hard drive you know you have to, the files are always there data is always there it's just that they're just marked for overwrite which means we'll write over those files with new shared experiences with our SE inferior later and that's how like for example an INFJ or an ISFJ would be able to unlearn those concepts and arrive to newer conclusions right so anyway it's uh, it's a thing and to prove that this works and to prove that the content of this specific episode within season 18 actually fundamentally works when we release uh, expert mode in the very near future and the TE users, the expert thinkers will actually finally be able to use a process of qualification instead of a process of elimination directly with our personality test. Extrovert thinkers, I have not forgotten about you. I haven't, I promise. We are developing software so that you folks can interact with the type grid and interact with our personality test as well.
And so that way that we're not going to be just giving preferential treatment to the TE users. It's taken a long time because guess what? I have TE critic. But interestingly enough, I have to give credit to um, an ISTP who came up with some of the core concepts for expert mode just for you folks because his TE nemesis was kind of worried about the other TE users within this community and he made sure to come up with a method or a way or an experience that should enable you expert thinkers who make decisions and judgments based on a process of qualification, et cetera, like, like, um, like summing things up, like a addition, right? So you're not stuck in this whole subtraction thinking of TI users, which is a process of deduction or a process of elimination, et cetera. I'm really repetitive right now, my bad. But the point is, this is why we're doing it, right? So, and I wanted you guys to understand the logic behind that system, which is where this episode within season 18 is coming from. I have to show you specifically how to type with cognitive access and then how to drill down further with cognitive orbit so that you can actually identify one of the 16 types using the type grid with that process of qualification, not necessarily elimination. That way, everybody is capable of interacting with a type grid and not just this OTI master race crap that I always hear. Because outside of the CSJ community, it's the INTJ master race. But inside the, the CSJ community, if you're a TI user, you're part of the master race. No, we're not discriminating. I don't care about that. That's not the point. The point is, is that everyone will have the same amount of accessibility to this software, to these concepts. It's just taking me a little bit more time. I got TE Critic, okay? Yes, it's taking a lot more time, but it's coming. So, anyway. So, uh, whatever. Uh, that's it. Folks, uh, Q&A time. If you have any questions relating to the content of this episode, now's the time. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for watching and thank you uh, for being here. If you found this lecture useful, helpful, educational, enlightening, please leave a comment below and uh, we would be happy uh, to uh, read that and potentially answer your questions, etc. So hopefully um, you guys got some value out of this lecture and you could actually see how the type grid interacts with things. I just had to go a little bit further with access because people get really confused with access, even though technically orbit's a little bit more confusing, but hopefully seeing the different photos of the different people, these different types, you can kind of understand just where people are coming from, etc. So yeah, uh, looks like I don't have questions so I think with that, I am going to be ending the episode now as I'm waiting for the time to run out. And okay, yes, uh, thank you for congratulations and all that. And uh, with all that being said, folks, I'll probably see you guys tomorrow night. Later.